welcome to the Pickleball Recovery Podcast, where we highlight products and practices to help you feel better faster, so you can spend less time stiff, sore, and injured, and more time on the court doing what you love. This podcast is sponsored by AlloMD. Don't just mask pain, eliminate it. AlloMD provides intense relief and advances continual repair for both acute injuries and chronic pain. All natural patented technology developed by doctors to get you back in the game fast without the use of opioids, steroids, or ANSAIDs. AlloMD, harnessing the power of pure natural ingredients that provide deep, penetrating repair. Patented, validated, natural. Learn more at www.allomd.com and make sure to use the discount code PBR at checkout to save $5 off your order. What's up? What's up? What's up? Welcome to Pickleball Recovery. I'm your host, Tim Ringgold. Hey, how you doing? Did you play any pickleball today? Hope you're having a good day. I am off the court right now, rebuilding for the new year. Uh, I set out to accomplish quite a lot this past calendar year uh, in the sport and wrecked my body along the way. Do as I say, not as I do, kids. So uh, I realized I really need to kind of step back and kind of build a foundation of flexibility, mobility, uh, and then strength uh, and coordination for the pickleball moves, if you will, Uh, rotational, you know, uh, movement, deep bending, you know, all the proper body mechanics that I just kind of was uh, compensating my way through the year and showing up with injury after injury after injury. And they weren't like debilitating injuries. They were just niggling injuries, but I was constantly, you know, nursing a this or a that, and I was just tired of it. So, uh, yeah, we are working. Uh, when I say we, it's my, my trainer, Kyle from stretch effect, who you've met on here. We're working on a six week program to get me fit for the masters in January, hit the ground running, uh, with a, you know, a solid base, a solid core. So looking forward to, uh, the new year. I think I've got 20 events on the calendar for next year. Lord knows how I'm going to fit all that in, but, uh, you know, um, go big, right? All right. Uh, Let's see. A couple of things. One, very exciting news. Pickleballrecovery.com. It's live. So you should go over and check it out because it's your one-stop shop for all your recovery needs, all your on-court and off-court support. It's all there. I mean, it's all there. So like tons of discounts on the site that you can't get anywhere else. Go check it out, please. Uh, That would be really cool. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry for coughing in your ear. And then what else is new? Um, if you are on YouTube, would you hit the like button or and or the subscribe button? Uh, because when you do that, when you engage with us on YouTube, then YouTube shows our videos to more people. And then that way more people find out how to spend more time on the court. If you're listening on Apple, would you just go down, scroll down and give us a quick five-star review? It takes like no time. That would be really appreciated. Uh, again, same rules apply. Like the more you engage with the, the uh, podcast, the more the platform shows it to new people. And if you're on Spotify, would you do the same? Just take a second, click on the ratings, uh, it opens it up and give it a five-star rating. Um, that would be most appreciative uh, or most appreciated. I would be most appreciative of that. So thanks in advance for all that. Okay, groovy. Let's get into this episode. Uh, In this episode, I interview my friend, uh, Dr. Sheree Ong, uh, who is the girlfriend of a dear longtime friend of mine named Joe Polish. And Joe and I have known each other for a long, long time. And Sheree is a surgeon, uh, plastic surgery surgeon in Scottsdale, Arizona, but has a background in trauma surgery and has, over the course of her career, kind of outlined what are all the ways in which the body responds and recovers quickly from surgery? And what are the things that inhibit the body from recovering from surgery? Now, I want to make a little distinction in this. There's a distinction between recovering from surgery and rehabbing 
from surgery. We're not talking about rehab. That's the work you'll do with your physical therapists, occupational therapists, trainers, et cetera. That's after you've recovered from surgery, but you can't start your PT or your rehab until you're fully recovered. How would you like to shortcut that? There are safe evidence-based ways to do that. And Dr. Ong is going to share those with you as she shares them with me in this interview. So pay attention, take some notes. There are several easy, actionable things on here for you or someone you love to help them recover more quickly from surgery. And finally, this uh, episode is dedicated to Lee Waters, who is facing a ACL reconstruction surgery, which is a pretty major surgery for an athlete uh, of any age. And, you know, uh, the older we are, the longer it takes us to recover and rehab. And so um, this goes out to Lee, because that's a pretty big deal. And uh, I've been thinking about you and wishing you a speedy recovery. Uh, Not sure if you know, this content gets to you in time (laughs) or it's like, Oh, I wish I had known that two weeks ago. Thanks, Tim. That's great. Thanks. Uh, so, but for the rest of you, this is really useful for when you or someone you love does need to have surgery or chooses to have surgery as that, as your, you know, course of action requires. Okay. So enough of all that, sit back, relax, enjoy the ride. Uh, and I will see you on the other side. (laughs) Dr. Sheree Ong, thanks for joining us on Pickleball Recovery. Thank you, Tim. It's great to have you. (laughs) Thank you. I'm excited to be here. (laughs) I'm excited that you're here as well. Uh, We are here in your beautiful office in Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, where I have been a patient before and you have come to my rescue. So I'm very excited that we once again get to hang out here, uh, this time without an IV. Uh, we have a headset, uh, connecting us. And the reason we're connecting today is because I got an email about a talk you gave that was right up our listener's alley. And it was two words I had never really put together, which was like surgical recovery or surgery recovery. And ever since starting this podcast, pickleball recovery, recovery is like, you know, this radar term. And, and I was like, Hey, wait a minute. What, what, what is this? And, uh, since we were already friends, I was excited to hear what you had to say. So I listened to that presentation and I was blown away by all the things I mean, there's a lot of things that can really change how someone approaches, goes through and recovers from a surgical procedure in much less time. Mm -hmm. And something we were talking about beforehand is picklers be crazy. We don't rest. We don't take the proper time to rest and recover. We want to get back out, back out, back out, because we need to hit that ball. So anything that helps us get back out on the court, court quickly is an advantage. And for many of us, we are doing like prehab and then we have an injury and we see a physical therapist and then we're doing exercises. But then sometimes many of us, it it goes too far and we've got to have surgery. Right. And so that's why this conversation is like perfect. And then the other way this conversation is perfect, I was telling you, is one of the pros at the time of this recording, her name's Lee Waters, top PPA professional player. Her nickname is Mama Waters. Uh, she tore her ACL in the U.S. Nationals just two weeks ago. Okay. And like, she's got to have ACL surgery in like a week. She's already said she's going to take the whole year of 2023 off to recoup and rehab. And for any pickler to say they're going to take a year off from pickle, the emotional toll that must take, the mental toll, as well as the physical toll. So what I'd love to do today is send this podcast to Lee. Like this is our, like Lee, we're thinking about you. We're, uh, you know, gunning for a a safe surgery and a great rehab, but like this is dedicated to Lee. Awesome. Um, and everyone like her who finds themselves playing one game too many and then, you know, finding themselves having to have surgery. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Tell us a little bit about your story as a surgeon. Like, how did becoming a surgeon seem like a super cool thing? Let's take a little backstory. Sure. I it's it's very interesting how this whole you, you mentioned a little bit about the talk I did, you know, in January, mm-hmm. and a lot of the things we're going to speak today is just my experience and learning that I've had over you know twenty two years, 
And it first started off, you know, for the first part of my career, I was really in trauma surgery. So I really took care of the sickest patients in the ICU, people that really had on ventilators and things. So I learned so much about recovery and how the body can heal. So that I learned a lot from that. And then really looking into the next phase of my career, which was reconstructive surgery. And a lot of the things that we expect the body to do that we are not really giving it opportunity to do because we put so much so much expectation for it to do. Mm. And what you mentioned about pickleball is the same, like all the other th- stuff. Yeah. High achievers, not just pickleball players, but everyone, if we're doing fun, we're having fun, we're doing what we want to do, we just want to get better and we continue to push ourselves. Yep. So I think this is a great conversation to start with because I think it can really create a different mindset shift to many people, but it also gives them maybe a few tools that they can think about if they are going through surgery and then get to enjoy the stuff that they really love to do, like pickleball. Yeah. But my journey really started, it, how I became a surgeon is I love to create okay. and I love to solve problems. Okay. And solving problems is just looking at something and trying to put all the bits and pieces together and see this is the way to go. So surgery is really fun because there's a lot of things that need to be put together. Yeah. And then creativity is what I do in plastic surgery is really how do I make that more customized? How can I make it more beautiful? And I've really found my passion in in doing both of that together in what I do today. That's really cool. That's yeah. really cool. I did not know you had an ICU background mm-hmm. as well. Uh, I logged many hours in the ICU as a mm. music therapist, yep. uh, treating the sickest people in the hospital. When, yep. And that's what my TED Talk was based on, was that work was in those trenches. So uh, love that. Um, so let's think in, I like to think, and I know you like to think, we were talking about this, about like segments of time. Mm-hmm. So there's like before surgery, there's during surgery, and there's after surgery. Let's kind of break down those three segments. What are some things picklers or anyone can do to optimize and speed up that recovery time? And then let's really let them know just, let's make a big promise. Like how much improvement are we talking in terms of recovery time? 5%, 10%. Like, I think we th- you threw out a number of quite a bit higher than that in your presentation, didn't you? Yeah, I think, I think if we do the right things, we can actually improve it by 50%. Wow. Yes. That's a big difference. It's a big difference. Yeah. Okay. So that's hopefully got your attention, right? 50% reduction in recovery time before you get back on the court. Now you're listening. Okay. And we have actually done this. I've actually studied my patients doing some of the things that we do. Really? And them, you know, recovering and measuring that we have actually cut down the time at 50%. So it's, wow. it's something that can be done. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with before. Like you get the diagnosis or the you have the injury or whatever you have and the decision is made. We're going to get it on the calendar. How far before surgery should we start thinking about recovery? The moment you get the diagnosis. Wow. Okay. Because I think a lot of the outcomes from your surgery really starts with the pre-planning. Huh. Okay. And, and one of the biggest things that can make a big difference is usually anticipating and making the right changes right even before you have the surgery. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm thinking from an orthopedic, through an orthopedic lens, and I'm thinking about like, would that involve strength, mobility, nutrition, rest, hydration. Like I'm going through like, you know, in my head, what are like the big pillars? Sure. Right. So what are some things we should start to be pointing our attention at specifically? I think the first thing is really doing an assessment. Okay. Really looking at where you are today and the outcome of your surgery is going to be the um, result of all the stresses that's going on in yourself. Mm. So let's evaluate where you are mentally, where you're emotionally, where you're physically. Okay. So for an athlete, you know, are you, do you have a full schedule? Do you have things that you need to deal with from, you know, a mental standpoint, like a recent issue, uh, relationship issue, all those stresses add up. So I think when you, when you have a, and a lot of the athletes that you work with or your, your um, audience, Sometimes the, the injuries are not, you know, you don't plan on having an injury. So at that moment, you say, okay, I've torn my ACL, right. for example. And we're like, okay, we need to have surgery. So I think at that point, we should sit down and say, let's 
first of all, we need to find a, a plan of how bad the injury is. Yep. And then really find out, okay, is the severity of this injury like a 2 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10? How severe, how big is this surgery? And then let's be real and sit down and discuss where are we? in terms of our life stressors, yeah. whether it's emotional, mental, and everything, because we have tested this again and again, and research has shown, they have actually had a research study on students having surgery, and when they have an exam coming up, their recovery is 40% slower. So not only just physical huh. stress, but the mental stress of it. Yeah. Right, so all of this adds up, and just be really honest with yourself and do an assessment and see where, are, where, am I, where am I. And then we can start to make those changes in preparing for your surgery because the outcomes is so going to be depending on how much time and how much things you need to eliminate in order to allow you to recover faster. Okay. And that is the big mindset shift. That is. And, I, and it's funny because as I'm thinking about this, like, oh, wait, I'm a whole human. With a right. family, with a job, with a career, with two dogs, with two kids, right? Like I have all these things, exactly. right? That, that each individually could be a stressor on top of when I go into athlete mode, I get very um, like tunnel vision, yeah. you know, like I'm in a silo called athlete and as if none of those other things impact the athlete. Correct. When in fact they do. It's so multifactorial. Yeah. And it also depends on your health. If you are, as you said, nutrition, mobility, how is your body ready yep. for the surgery? Mm. If you're a tip-top shape in nutrition, you're getting enough recovery, you're eating the right things, you're getting the good rehab mobility, you're not having an infection, in a, a lung infection, a viral infection. Right. If you take all that really truly assess where you are, that's then we start to make those aha moments and say, okay, what the recovery really depends on all those factors. So you recovering and me recovering may be different because right. our bodies are at a different state yeah. at that point. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so kind of assessing the whole picture. Correct. Where, so where are all the brush fires? You know, not to, the, the, the injury is not the only, it may not be the only brush fire in your life that, right. that you need to attend to right now. Exactly. Because what would be the point? It's like, what would be the point of going through surgery if you have other brush fires that are stressors that are kind of undoing the, all the work you're doing in this one area? It's, it's like, what is it pouring uh, water into a bucket with a hole in it? You know, that's, that's the kind of the analogy I'm seeing. So mm -hmm. kind of get your whole house in order, see where all the different brush fires are, make time and space to kind of settle things down so that you can go into this phase. I'm going to say as stress-free as possible. Right. Is that a reasonable statement? Yeah, it was just the least amount of stressors on your body, yeah. you know, total stressors. There you go. There you go. And total stressors aren't just physical people. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's, what we're, that's what we're coming away with here. And that is mostly, that's mostly true because most of our stressors are not physical. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's interesting in the 21st century, we've, you know, the, the emotional, the social, the spiritual stressors that we're dealing with probably outweigh the physical stressors uh, that most of us that are, let's be honest, listening to this podcast are pretty far up the, you know, the ladder of, mm -hmm. you know, socioeconomic and uh, doing pretty well uh, in the, if you're playing pickleball, let's be honest, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So paying, paying attention to those other areas. Great. Okay, cool. So start with the assessment. We look for the fires. Uh, what else do we need to think about before surgery? Really having a good conversation with your surgeon. Okay. And really understanding all the things you need to know and asking the questions so you are set up for a great recovery. Well, gee, what questions should I be asking? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> You know, I think that here are some of the tips that I can give to people to think about because okay. most surgeons, like here's a sheet of paper right. and follow the instructions and see you in a day of surgery, right? I think really one of the things to ask about in terms of surgery mm -hmm. is number one is how can I make the surgical process as pain-free as possible? Obviously, you're going to have surgery, you're going to have some pain, yep. but I think things that surgeons don't really tell you is all the things around how to expedite your surgery so you can heal 50% better. The first is um, 
really having a good understanding of all the things that you should or should not do after surgery. And just be okay. really clear on that. Okay. Because if you move too quickly or you, you know, hurt yourself two steps forwards, you know, really one step, you know, taking one step forward would be two steps backwards. Gotcha. I said that incorrectly. That's right. But um, one of the things that would make your recovery a lot easier is pain. And so I really like this long acting numbing medicine called Expirel, asking your surgeon to see whether they can use Expirel. A lot of orthopedic surgeons love it and use it. Okay. It is a long acting numbing medication like okay. the lidocaine, but it's yep. actually long acting and it can slowly release numbing medicine up to 72 hours after surgery okay. in your surgical site. Okay. Hold the phone. So Exporel. Is E-X-P-A-R-E-L, Exparel. Exparel. All right. And you said 72 hours. Mm -hmm. That's, I'm not a math major. Is that three, three days. days? Right. That's three days. That's a long time to be pain-free because usually the worst experience of anybody's life is that afternoon. Because, you know, you're in and out of surgery in the morning and they've got you in your car before, you know, it's practically like drive-through surgery. Get out, go, next. Um and when your, 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 oh, how do I put this? Whatever procedural pain meds they gave you mm -hmm. wear off, there's that drop between that and what, whatever oral crap they give you. Because yep. it's, it's either Tylenol 800 and it's not enough, or it's like Norco and it, and it makes you sick, right? So you feel awful. And it's usually doesn't really help too much with the pain anyway. And, and there's this drop between, and that, is the worst. That's just the worst experience. Speaking from experience. Um, so what I'm hearing you say is that this Exparel will keep doing the job for three days. It will continue. Yes, exactly. It will continue wow. to release a numbing medicine in your surgical site for up to set for three days. Okay. And the great thing is, as you mentioned, the pain, the acute pain yep. is the first couple of days is the worst. It's the worst. And the numbing medicine, which is typically Marcaine, you know, wears off after a few hours. Yeah. And the benefit of avoiding narcotics, as you know, is the byproduct mentally you feel better. Yes. And then secondarily, you don't, you kind of avoid constipation. Yes. And a lot of women, especially women, but men also have nausea yeah. with the pain meds. Yes. So now you, with that, you can solve like two or three things that this is one of the limited limitations for narcotics. Brilliant. Yeah. Love it. Fantastic. Yeah. And the, the research, just not to go off topic, but the research on narcotics for pain management are horrifying. Uh, and uh, if you get prescribed it for pain management, uh, whether it's just for chronic pain or for acute pain for surgery, the, one of the studies, I was at a conference and I was pre co presenting with somebody, and one of the studies was for those who stay on that medication for 30 days, mm -hmm. seven out of 10 of them will be on that medication a year later. Yeah. They yeah. never get off it, They're, they get hooked. Yeah. And so, like, it is no joke. Like, it is a big uh, problem. You know, like, it is so important for mm -hmm. us. If we can avoid taking opioids at all costs, it is, it is you know, so incumbent upon us to figure out strategies to do it. And being in this world, I had never heard of Exparel. So that's really, really exciting news. Yeah. And on the topic of pain too, any time we can reduce pain, that pain is actually a physical stressor. Mm -hmm. So your you're mentally, your 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 nervous system reacts to pain. Yes. And so if we can reduce the pain, we're also helping everything all around. Yep. It's like a vicious circle, right? When exactly. you, you have the pain, then you have the story about the pain, which triggers the anxiety or the fear or the anger or whatever the corresponding exactly. emotion is. Mm -hmm. Stress response gets triggered. Mm -hmm. Would this be inappropriate? No, we, we want to talk about the stress response after. I want to talk about it after. But we're still in the before. Yeah, and so other things that you can ask your surgeon is Exparel is a big yep. one yep. because they have to inject it the, the, during the surgery. Mm. And then, you know... If some of the symptoms that you get, like in nausea, one of the things I like a lot is how can I prevent the stuff before the surgery? Yep. So putting a patch behind the ear called scopalamine is super helpful. Scopalamine? Scopalamine patch. Okay. And you just basically for people who are prone to motion sickness, putting it behind the ear before surgery oh. and now... They don't have the nausea hmm. after surgery. Cool. I mean, that's the experience is just not going to the, you know, it, vomiting nice. and yeah. having nausea. 
the horrible. worst. Yeah, the nausea worst. is like one of the worst. I don't care how tough you are. More nausea is like one of the worst feelings ever. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. So, yeah. so that would be really smart okay. to to get that ask beforehand. For that. Yeah. Ask for that, and um, you know, then getting prepared on what to do after surgery. Okay. Most importantly, block your schedule off. Okay. So you have time to recover. Yep. Don't try to put twenty meetings or all these things, um, and then really looking at what you need. You know, if you need physical therapy, you need to, as a lot of tools we can talk about how to enhance healing, yep. but be able to schedule those things in advance. Yes. Massages, things like that. Yep. Right? Yep. And please don't blow off your PT. Don't do it. I did it once. It was one of the biggest mistakes in my young athletic career was, I, I can do this at home. Yeah. I got this. I don't need to, I didn't need to go there to do those exercises. I can do them at home. And yeah. then the blow off meter goes, boop. Oh yeah. Right. When you're mm-hmm. at home, uh, I'll do them tomorrow or I'll do them later today. And that turns into all doom never. So yeah, yeah block that time for PT and then go. Cool. Yeah. Um, as we're going into surgery, I'm wondering just about rest, you know, uh, you know, in terms of my body's overall health, just not going in tired or run down, I'm imagining is because it's a trauma to the body, you know, mm-hmm. it probably helps to not just get in good night's sleep because it's hard to get a good night's sleep before anything, but like work your way towards that mm-hmm. might be a smart idea also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just, just doing all the things that you need for your body to heal. Yep. Sleeping, you know, nutrition, yep. hydration, all the things. And then I like to preamp the surgery with a lot of things that will be helpful after surgery. Okay. So being proactive in nutrition. Okay. You really need more protein to heal. Your body yes. needs collagen. You need things like that. And Preach. so being able to eat more extra protein, being able to eat more fiber for the pooping you discuss, but also all the nutrients that your body needs. Okay. And just really prepare for that upfront. Before you have surgery, let's just start doing that. That's really smart. And, and one of the big ones is histamine. And, and people don't even histamine. talk about it because huh. histamine is in a lot of different foods and during the time of healing your body you don't want to have a lot of itching and a lot of histamine response because this causes continued inflammation okay the key about surgical healing is you want to turn on the inflammation and then turn it off as quickly as possible so then you can continue to do what you do and histamine triggers in triggers inflammation correct right so wait a minute so there's like Low fat diet, there's low carb diet. Are you saying there's a low histamine diet? You can take foods okay. that well, are low in histamine. Okay, so oh, this is great because I never knew this was even like a, a barometer. Okay. What would be some examples of either high histamine foods to watch out for or low histamine foods to get at the grocery store? It's actually really simple. Okay. Anything that is fermented, a processed uh-huh. usually has higher histamine. Okay. Anything that's fresh usually has the lowest histamine. Okay. For example, cheese, wine, sauerkraut, kombucha has the highest histamine. Interesting. And then the fresher your food is, there's just less histamine. Okay. And, you know, in terms of surgical healing, one of the biggest things besides itch, uh, besides vomiting yep. is Itching. Yeah. Itching keeps you worst. up at night. Yeah. So if we're going to avoid any of those things, itching is a big one. Okay. Um, and so li- keeping a low histamine diet would be super helpful wow. prior to surgery. That's really cool. And after, I imagine. And but, after. But prior. See, this is what's really cool. I hadn't really ever thought this through. Mm. Like your body's going to be in a certain physiological state. It's going to have what's in it and what's not during surgery, which is going to what your body's going to immediately reach for and recruit Mm -hmm. to start healing in the first minute after surgery. Right. So what I'm hearing you say is like, have the ecosystem be set up for that recovery process and that healing process that can't start once you get home. That has to, you have to kind of like preload your body with what it's going to need that morning because it's going to start drawing on it right then and there. It's not waiting for you to Bring it in. So Correct. That, that's really interesting. Yeah. Think about your body is a hundred percent full of energy. Yeah. Your body is going to direct 
you know, energy to as a surgical site to heal. Yep. You don't want to direct 20% to an inflamed gut, another 10% to something else, an infection, a virus, your stress. So your body has limitations in terms of your total energy capacity. If you're doing 20 things at one time, it's going to delegate yes. the total amount of energy to other things. So like, it's going to give you 20, 20% to your surgical site to heal. We wow. want to redirect all that stuff there. That's a great, great yeah. analogy. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's like you've thought about this before. So. <laughs> just yesterday. <laughs> just, I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night and it just came to me. It that's just, right. I'm, 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 <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. So that's cool. We've met with the surgeon. We've, we've done it. Well, we've done an assessment. We've met with the surgeon. We've preloaded our body. Um, are we ready for surgery? Yes. Or is there anything else? Ready to I go. Think, I think you should have surgery. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's go have surgery. Let's go to have surgery. To cut. We're going to go have surgery now. We'll come back. All right. We're back. We've had surgery. <clears throat> Anything uh, from a, you know, during process. Um, one thing I know as a music therapist is managing stress the morning of surgery mm. really matters. So uh, I'll, I'm going to throw this one in there as a free bonus. Uh, have a playlist of music that relaxes and inspires you that you listen to on the way to the surgery center. And as you are going in for your check-in and as you're going in for any of your pre-op, have your earbuds in because that music will keep resetting your nervous system and turning the stress response off because we want to have that stress response off as much as possible leading into the procedure. So that's a, that's a, that's a free one on me. But what other things would you say like day of would be good? I mean, practice? what you said just now is, is so critical. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to belittle it. It's not, it's really, really important because a lot of times, even before the anesthesiologist puts someone to sleep, yep. they like think about something positive and, and just really create that mindset shift because that's the last moment before like you undergo anesthesia. That's yep. so important. To, yeah. Like when stress on it, that's important to really keep your stress level the lowest you can right before surgery. Okay. In, in my practice, we, we are doing music prior to surgery in our nice. office. Nice. And then we also implementing uh, virtual reality. Ooh. And so they go into another environment where where they can really escape, which that's is which great. is awesome. So that anyway, so not good. to digress, but yeah. that's so important. That's really cool. Uh, imagery, you mm -hmm. know, mental imagery and, and virtual reality really helping to, you know, uh, hand them the imagery. Here's some imagery for you. You don't have to think it up yourself. We're just Correct. giving it to you. Uh, the brain can't tell the difference between whether it's imagining something or it's experiencing it perceptually. So either one, it has a reaction to that, right. a physiological reaction in the nervous system. So that's super, super cool. All right. We go in for surgery. We're as chilled out as we can be. Uh, they, we wake up in the PACU and they put us in the in the uh, wheelchair as soon as possible. And they put us in our car. Yes. Before you know it, we're stopping by Walgreens for a prescription. And then what? Well, hopefully you pick your prescriptions before your surgery, but... <laughs> okay. That sounds like <laughs> a smarter thing way to do that it. that some people may not know, just another little tip is just what you eat after anesthesia will be very important. Don't oh. eat anything, something bland, something liquid, something, as people say, just have soup or like a sandwich or something. Okay. You don't want something too oily. I had okay. a friend before, this, after surgery, they want to have Mexican food. That's the last thing you want to eat because your body is just not ready and you will throw it up, right? Okay. So just being like, just little things that people don't really talk about, but I think that's just little tips here and there. Okay. But, then you you have hopefully after you're on the way home you already got everything ready yes. you got your meals ready you have your your plan one thing i like to do that's a bonus as well after surgery is how can we detox the anesthesia outside as quickly as possible Ooh, okay. so here's when the iv therapies can come in yep just Planning for IV session, IV therapy after surgery, where you're getting some nutrients like vitamin C, B vitamins, glutathione, yep. alpha lipoic acid. Yep. What that does is helps the liver detox, get the anesthesia out as quickly as possible. Okay. Then your body can start doing the things that it needs to do. Again, reducing total body stress. Nice. Is that yep. just a, a single session that is good for after surgery? I think so. Yeah. It depends on everyone. But yeah, yeah I think that would be helpful. Within the first 48 hours? Exactly. Right? If okay. you can. And, and it's never been more available? Right. Right. It's amazing. You know, Nurses can come to your house. You can have them come right to your, your exactly. home and, and do IV therapy in your home. There is a an IV therapy 
store opening up in a strip mall near you uh, as we speak. Cringe, cringe, because I don't know who actually works in those yet. Yeah. But <laughs> I see them everywhere. Like yes. I, I'm, I'm kind of blown away it's by really, the proliferation you, yeah. of this. Uh, and if you're a doc, if you go to an integrative doc, or you, uh, maybe they do it at their facility as well. Luckily ours does, but yeah, that's, that's a great, great shout. Uh, so, so detoxing the anesthesia never would have thought of those three words as, mm -hmm. as a, as a, as a indicator, you know, of, right. of, of recovery improvement. Okay. Um, how, and, and I'm sure it's like, you know, well, it's up to your doctor, of course. Um, but can we talk about, uh, the importance of movement versus stagnation? Mm. in terms of the body and what the body's designed to do and what it likes to do and what we prevent. And yeah, obviously it's, it depends on the, on the surgeon and the type of surgery, but yes. I'm such a believer of movement and lymphatic movement is so important because oh, oh. we tell them what that is. A okay. lot of people don't know what that is. Yeah. So every time we do surgery, the lymph is actually a, is a byproduct of, of your blood flow. And so it carries all the bad stuff back into the places it needs to go, like the liver and the lymphatic channels in order to get rid of all the bad stuff. So if you, it's like the, 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 the freeways that open for everything to move through. Right. So if your lymphatic channels are clogged, right. you you'll, say you have ACL repair, your knee is going to stay swollen for a longer period of time. Mm. That's another thing that's so helpful. A lot of my patients, I get them to do a lymphatic massage after, even before surgery, just get that all the pathways yes. open. And then after they can do that and their swelling can come down by so quickly, so quickly. Yeah. So that's so important is movement, especially lymphatic movement in okay. times of surgery. Great. Great shout. I yeah. don't think uh, most of us know enough about what the lymphatic system really does. And mm -hmm. if they did, they'd, you know, whoa, that's really important. I, yeah. I'm going to pay more attention to that. And it's so, um, it's also very relaxing. Yeah. It's not really a, a, a really a, like deep tissue massage. No. It gets everything moving. They're not walking on your back. No, no, no. no. Not the Thai massage type. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, we might do some IV. We might do some lymphatic massage. Um, what else? And then let's talk about the really cool stuff. Okay. Okay. So these are things that can really enhance your recovery that what makes that extra boost yep. in order to get someone 50%. These are the advanced hacks, so okay. to speak. Okay. And I like to bring in like things that will help look at how can we enhance healing in a surgical site. So let's talk about your athlete here. Yeah. ACL repair, yeah. right? So I'm going in there and I'm trying to repair something that's torn or broken. And the surgeon goes in there, put some sutures, maybe put some foreign material and sew it up. So now what happens in the knee, like an ACL, a couple of things need to happen. Number one, you need blood flow. Yep. You need oxygen. And then you're going to need things that will help that tendon or you know, your ligament heal. Yep. And so I look at what are the things that my knee needs in order to heal. So first thing first, I'm going to need all the rest and you know sleep and nutrition, all that. We covered that. Mm -hmm. Locally, let's get more oxygen to the area. Okay. Right? So let's get hyperbaric oxygen would be a good one. Okay. And it is, again, studies upon studies showing hyperbaric oxygen therapy yes. in terms of healing. Yes. So, so getting good. oxygen there would be awesome. And then in my practice, we use ozone. Ah, and okay. we use ozone as a way before surgery to clean the blood, so yep. to speak. But after surgery, a high amount of ozone to be converted to oxygen and allow for enhanced oxygen utilization in the body to reduce healing and pain and also like you know, oxygen to the tissues. Yeah. And so I think that would be really cool. And then the raw materials that the ligament needs. Yeah. What are the building blocks? The building blocks. Yeah. So collagen and protein, super important. Mm -hmm. I like using naturally producing protein. So protein like whey powders are all, well, you know, they're not natural. Yeah. The body knows what to do with what's already there. Yeah. So collagen or, or bone broth would be great. Bone broth. Just really getting that easily available collagen for the body, vitamin C and all the building blocks. And then I like to use 
peptides in order to help that area kind of heal even more. So there are a couple of peptides that can be used after surgery as well. Yeah. One of them being, is it BPC-157? Did I get it right? Yes. Yes. I keep hearing about it. My doc's telling me about it all the time. He's yeah. like, you want to look this up. You want to yeah. mention that so we can just plant the seed here? Sure. I think peptides, first of all, what are peptides? Peptides are naturally occurring protein molecules in your body. Your body naturally makes them the 4,000 different peptides. Insulin is a common one most people know. It helps drop blood pressure. So BPC-157 is a natural protein that your stomach makes. Mm -hmm. So as your stress level goes up, it's an anti-inflammatory mm. and healing peptide. It helps everything work better. It's like, I call it the garden angel. Nice. Because it gets your hormones working better, everything working better, upregulates all the receptors. Nice. And I really like that that peptide. It's one of the peptides we use for healing as well. Nice. Yeah. Can we uh, talk about a, a specific goal when it comes to protein. Uh, we talked about that there's better mm -hmm. types of protein, right? Mm -hmm. um, recently, I went through a, a, a very specific conditioning recovery program where I was really taught the importance of protein on, on recovery. And I used to only think of protein as like building muscle. And then it dawned on me that it was like, well, yeah, building muscle is recovery from the trauma of exercise. Like, right. oh, oh, oh. So, so we're talking about the same thing. We're just using different words, mm -hmm. right? So it, it got me to start thinking about protein as this building block of recovery. And it's like, okay, great. And because there are so many apps that measure your macros, you know, how much fat you're getting per day, how much carbs you're getting per day, how much protein you're getting today, it's never been easier to actually measure and track the just grams of protein that you're eating. And for different types of outcomes, there are usually some guidelines as to like a percentage of your body weight or a percentage of for one pound, this much gram, like there's usually like a calculation, right? So for me right now, I'm weighing at about 160. And for this training program, they wanted me at a minimum of 0.85 grams per pound. So it was mm -hmm. like, oh, okay. So like 135 grams of protein per right. day was what my body was going to need to rebuild right. everything I was doing to it by exercising. Right. I had no idea I was destroying that much of my body by exercising and that I needed that much protein just to recover. Right. Much less what you do to your body when you have surgery. That's a, that's a pretty big trauma to the body. So now it's going to be recruiting building blocks i.e. protein. Right. So can you talk to us a little bit about what are some guidelines for how much protein? Because I think people are afraid they're going to like have too much protein. And I'm always laughing. I'm like, I don't know if too many people see the doc for like too much protein, but what might be some, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So first of all, you, you mean your exercise is the same thing in terms of surgery. It's a stressor. Yeah. And the, <laughs> the common, you funny, you said 0 0.85 because the number that an average would be 0 0.84. Oh, wow. So it's very similar. So 0 0.84 grams per pound, again, depending on the severity of your surgery. Gotcha. Right? Gotcha. So I think you kind of have to kind of look at where you are and then how much protein you need. But a, a, a simple number would be 0 0.84 yep. grams per pound. Per pound. And so what you might do is like put your weight in your calculator and... I don't know how to do the calculation. Never mind. I'm not a math major. People figure it out. I'll let you figure out how to do that. Okay. So that we've talked about the type of protein, the amount of protein. We've talked about uh, peptides. We've talked about IV. Um, let's talk about the, the role that the stress response plays as an inhibitor mm -hmm. to recovery okay. real, real quick. Sure. We'll kind of circle back around to that mind, body, Connection. whole person, right? Absolutely. Um, when I was working in oncology, the research on patients going through chemotherapy that were stressed versus went through a relaxation protocol, there was like a statistically significant difference in the effectiveness of the chemotherapy. And that really weighed on me early on in my career that like what you put your body through is totally influenced by what you put your mind through. Absolutely. So let's, let's just talk a little bit about stress and, you know, how should we take, how, how seriously that matters when it comes to just surgery recovery? 
So this is something that is is probably the most important. Wow. And and, and not not really say the most important. It's so critical. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I've been a surgeon for twenty two years, and every time I see someone and I say, "Why are they healing slower?" Every time. I notice something in their life, whether they have a chaotic home life or, you know, naturally when someone heals slower, I go back and I find something up to the point. Now I obviously preempt that and ask them before surgery, how much stress they're having. And I, the, obviously my surgery is not a, like a broken leg, but right. you have to have immediate surgery. I have time to get them ready and maybe postpone the surgery or cancel the surgery just to have the best outcome. So really that is very critical and people underestimate that because they think they're invincible. And we do that all the time. I do that the most too. I can handle it. I can do this. I don't have to go to sleep. I don't need to sleep. I can do that, have surgery and back on my oh, feet next man. week. But that's, a, that's, that's unfortunately the, isn't the that, truth. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. You mean it wasn't the peptides after all? No, no, it was, it was stress. Okay. All right. Um, what? have I forgotten to ask about when it comes to the after surgery that would play a difference, you know, or make a difference in recovery time? I think you've asked a lot of really, really important questions. And I think these tools are going to be super critical for people to put in the tool belt when yep. they decide to have surgery, because ultimately we all want to set our bodies right in terms of going to the surgery and having the best outcomes possible. And one thing I can tell you is really think about if you're going for a race, like you're going to show up in pickleball, you're going to show up that day in competition. That's the final of the finals. Yeah. Are you going to go in 50% ready? Or are you going to go in 90% ready, 100% ready? Right. Just think about surgery that way. Yeah. And you want to just tune up everything and then just go into the surgery with everything ready to go so that you will do really well and win the gold medal prize, which is to get to the surgery as fast as possible and recover the best so you can get back to do the stuff that you really enjoy. Which is play more pickleball. Pickleball. I still need pickleball. to learn how to play pickleball. Uh, <laughs> join us. It's bliss. <laughs> <laughs> Where do my followers follow you online? So our website is onginstitute.com. How do you spell it? www.onginstitute.com. Okay. Awesome. And are you on... The Facebooks, the Instagrams. Ong Institute. Ong Institute. Yes. All right. Sheree Ong, thank you for joining us on Pickleball Recovery. Thank you, Tim. Thanks so much for listening. Do you want to know the number one mistake picklers make that leads to increased pain, soreness, stiffness, and injury? Just head over to www.pickleballrecovery.com and download my free guide to playing with less pain and more enjoyment. Listen. Pickleball makes us feel young at heart, but not necessarily young in body. So go download my free guide at www.pickleballrecovery.com. See you next time.